Welcome, everyone. Oh. Good evening. We're going to get started. I invite you to come take a seat, take a cup of coffee, then to come take a seat. I'm Rabbi Shuli Paso. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at B'nai Jeshurun. So glad you're joining us tonight. This is the third in the lecture series for our Faith and Public Life Initiative, a year-long initiative here at BJ that is trying to do a number of things. I would say two main things. On the one hand, we're trying through this work to build on the legacy and the ethos of the BJ community. Uh, this community's historical involvement in social and political action, and to recommit at this moment, at this political moment, to the Jewish values that call us to act in the face of suffering and in the face of injustice. And then on the other hand, one of the goals of this initiative is to forge another kind of commitment, a commitment to having nuanced and respectful conversations about what is going on in this country and in the world, and to draw from another set of Jewish ideas and Jewish values, the values of cheshbon ha-nefesh, self-reflection, looking at our own role in the current situation, the value of dan lechaf sechut, of giving the benefit of the doubt, the value of humility, the value of derech eretz, civility, and to draw from this aspect of the Jewish tradition to open ourselves up to other perspectives in order to listen to other stories without demonizing people whose positions and opinions are different from our own. And we might think of this as the spiritual practice of humble conviction. Humble conviction of being righteous but not self-righteous, of being uncompromising on values and of standing for something, but without being dismissive or arrogant. And so when we ask the question, and one of the animating questions, one of the four animating questions of the Faith and Public Life Initiative is, what is BJ's role as a Jewish spiritual institution at this political moment? When we ask that question, I think we need to be asking it both in terms of what action we take, how we speak out against bigotry and discrimination and injustice of all kinds, and in terms of what action we can take to heal some of the political and social breaches, the intense divides, the polarization. We need to be asking, how can we best cultivate humble conviction? And our speaker tonight is an expert in humble conviction, or at the very least in why it's so hard for people to hold a posture of humble conviction and why that may be so important. And we're really thrilled to be learning from his wisdom and expertise. Dr. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist at the NYU School, Stern School of Business. His research examines the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultures, including the cultures of American progressives, conservatives, and libertarians. He uses his research to help people understand and respect the moral motives of people with whom they disagree. His four TED Talks, which have been viewed more than six million times, are on the topics of political psychology, religion, the causes of America's political polarization, and how America can heal after the bitter 2016 election. Dr. Haidt is the author of several books, including the upcoming, being published in July 2018, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Haidt. Thank you so much, Shuli. Um, that was an absolutely perfect introduction. Uh, I, I didn't have my pen out in time to write down all of the, the Hebrew words for those civic virtues. I'll have to get them from you later. Um, but in, in terms of you know, setting the stage for the, the urgency of this problem uh, and the unique resources that Jewish communities have, uh, have to address them. 
Um, so I, I grew up in Scarsdale. I, uh, my, uh, we were members of the Scarsdale Synagogue. Um, I became an atheist a year or two after my bar mitzvah and never really, <clears throat> never really looked back. And, um, uh, and then uh, lived and worked at various universities. Uh, and kind of on a fluke, um, I, I moved back to New York in 2011 to take a one-year position at NYU. Um, and uh, they liked me and I liked them and I loved, loved New York. And so uh, I took, uh, took the job at NYU and suddenly remembered what it was like to live in a place where it seems like half the people are Jewish. And, um, and I've, I've really been enjoying it, the, the, the intellectual life, the, the intellectual life at, at so many of the synagogues. Um, when, once my son reached an age at which I had to make the decision, uh, was I going to give him a Jewish education? And I, and I said, yes, I, I must. Uh, my wife and I joined, uh, joined Central Synagogue. Um, and it was through, and uh, Rabbi Bookdahl is just, is just wonderful. And she was engaging in, she, she, you know, after the election, it, uh, a very difficult political landscape, um, she w was interested in these topics. She was giving some great sermons on it. And that, uh, I forget what the exact origin of the project that we did at Central with Rabbi Auerbach, but um, um, I came in to talk to uh, uh, Rabbi Bookdahl and just looking at the ways that the Jewish tradition had these resources, these intellectual resources around the benefits of viewpoint diversity, the benefits of argument. These are the exact things that I was studying and working on in my work at NYU. Um, I run an organization called the Heterodox Academy, which I'll talk about, uh, talk about later. Jeremy's our communications director. Um, <clears throat> But the, the, the genius, the brilliance of the Jewish tradition on recognizing how limited and biased we each are and how much we benefit from a good argument or conversation partner. That's the origin of this whole project. So what I'd like to do now is show you, uh, I'll give you a little overview of some things in moral psychology and direct them towards this question you're engaged in as a community, these questions of uh, uh, faith and, and uh, public life. And wait, let me just turn this screen. That I, so I was on your website, and I saw that, that you had, somebody had put together this as the thing on your website. And I was looking at the picture like, oh, wow, that was a long time ago. I still had some, some black in my hair. That was, like, that was 2011, 2012. And, and I was getting all nostalgic, like, you know, boy, you know, think of what our public life was like back then. You remember that, that really nasty election we had in 2012? Remember that? Remember the 47%? versus you didn't build that, man, those were low blows. That was nasty, vicious stuff. You know, of course, things have gotten a little worse since then. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just hard to believe how, how far our, our, our civic life, our public life uh, has fallen, how much the polarization and anger and hatred has increased. Um, and so that is the context for what is happening to us. That is the context for, for my talk. Now, uh, of course, Trump went on to win the election, and we just had the most as astonishing year of, of my life. Um, uh, things happening that nobody could, nobody could have thought would be back. Uh, uh, you know, some of the worst things of the 20th century all sort of seem to show up in 2017. Um, to put some numbers on it, I want to show you this, uh, this graph from Pew, from the Pew survey, um, showing where we are as a country. This is really quite astonishing. Uh, Pew has collected survey data, nationally representative survey data, on the views of Americans. They have a set of questions that they've been asking since the early 90s. <clears throat> and so uh, f uh, um, there are 10 that they can trace all the way back to the 90s. <clears throat> what are your views on, on uh, you know, aid to the needy, a couple of race issues, immigration, 
government, environmental regulation, homosexuality, peace through strength. So they have a whole, think about a whole basket of survey items and then ask how far apart are different groups? On, the, the, take the absolute value of the difference, whether it's up or down, how far apart on average are different groups? So for example, so here's the graph. It's hard for you to see, but I'll just, I'll walk you through it. Um, there's a bunch of lines. They're all values between five and 10. They go up and down a little bit. Um, but just to illustrate, uh, I guess you, you uh, can you see that? Maybe I, I can barely see it. Uh, the color isn't sharp. The red and black color isn't sharp at all. Okay, I feel like more. Um, so what, you know, I don't know, maybe something's wiping out like red or some particular color. Is there, yeah, can we turn off the light on the screen? Is there, a, if anyone can find that control. Uh, but I'll just tell you what this is. Uh, this is how far apart men and women are on average on these 10 items. And what it shows is that in 1994, men and women were five or six points apart, and now they're six or seven points apart. So no change. Men and women are not further apart. Um, and then you go up by age, it's not much more. Um, so that, um, let's see if the next line will show up a little better. Uh, oh, it doesn't. Oh, no, it's, it's, I'm sorry. Here. Okay. Um, and then the only one of those lines that has gone up is religious attendance. If you compare people who go to church or religious services every week versus those who rarely or never go, they were, uh, I think, seven or eight points, uh, or no, four or five points apart, and now they're 11. So that's this line here. That's, there it is. So you can see that we are becoming more divided by religious participation, not by religion, but religious Jews, religious Catholics, religious uh, um, Protestants. Um, are moving apart from secular, what, more secular members of their groups. And um, that's important. But notice the magnitude of that. From you know, four points to 11, that's big. But look at this one. That's party. Look how far apart we are by party. And almost all of that has come about since 2004. Um, if you knew that somebody was a Republican or a Democrat in 1994 or earlier, you could guess some things about them, but you didn't know everything about them. And now you kind of do, at least in terms of their attitudes on 10 or 20 different issues. Um, we have sorted ourselves into parties. Those parties now have much less variance than they ever did before. People in a congregation like this versus a congregation in Brooklyn are just more homogeneous in terms of their attitudes than they would have been 20 years ago. That's happening all over the country. <clears throat> now, importantly, um, religious congregations, I think, hold out the most hope for actually doing something about this. They're different from other kinds of settings. So in their book, uh, American Grace, Robert Putnam, whom you may know of for Bowling Alone and Social Capital, Robert Putnam and his co-author, David Campbell, um, after reviewing the data on what effects do religious communities have on their, on their larger communities, they conclude that religiously observant Americans are better neighbors better citizens than secular Americans. They're more generous with their time and money, especially in helping the needy, and they're more active in community life. Being part of a congregation pulls you away from your iPhone, away from your TV, out into engagement with other people, and you, we generally bring out the best in each other in such communities. So as a country, we have, I think, an existential crisis. We have a national emergency, uh, and how we deal with it, we have limited resources to deal with it, but I think some, one of the most important areas or groups is religious communities of all sorts. <clears throat> so I was very pleased about your, your initiative here at, at, at BJ. Uh, so. Um, and so to, right, to see this Faith in Public Life initiative, I won't read it to you, you know the, the text, but I know you're engaged with a community of Michigan corrections officers, presumably most of whom voted for Trump and have very different attitudes on gun control and, and almost everything else from you. And so that's wonderful. Um, so let's talk about moral psychology and how it can help you in what you're trying to do as a congregation and in your lives where you talk with people who have different politics, where you are part of a, a corporation or a university or whatever institution you're part of, moral psychology can help you interact more effectively with people. <clears throat> oh, this is the cover of my book in the UK. It's a different cover. Um, I'm glad that that's not the cover that, I'm glad they didn't use that cover in America, but I enjoy being able to show it when I give talks. And then this is the paperback version, which I, I suggested the design. I suggested, well, can't we get like an angel and devil? Because this is really about polarization and how much we hate each other. So, <clears throat> so very briefly, moral psychology, there's really three principles that you need to know. And if you keep these in mind, 
you'll understand a lot of otherwise mysterious stuff that you see going on around you or when you read the newspaper. So the first principle, intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. Here's how to think about this. Every society that has writing has left us, I don't know, every word, almost all, every society with a wisdom tradition has left us the idea that the mind is divided into parts that sometimes conflict. A common metaphor is that our mind or soul is like a charioteer pulling uh, on horses. That was Plato's version of it. Um, and the, Plato's metaphor was that reason, uh, the charioteer, can and should rule over the passions. And, and that's what maturity is, reason coming to control the passions. But as a social psychologist in graduate school, um, oh, thanks Simon, as a social psychologist in graduate school, um, I came to believe that Plato was not a very good psychologist, that David Hume was actually much better. David Hume famously said that reason is and ought only to be <clears throat> the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. <clears throat> now the metaphor of a slave is not right, is not ideal, because reason is actually, um, reason is, has, has more powers, more insights. It's not, a better metaphor, I believe, is a press secretary. Reason is the press secretary of the emotions. Reason is out there to justify what it is that the emotional part has, has already made up its mind about. So I've been using this metaphor of the press secretary for about seven or eight years, and two days ago, two days ago, we got a much better one. This is absolutely amazing. There was an interview, uh, Peter Navarro um, is Trump's trade secretary, or something, he had some role in, in trade, and he said he was interviewed by Bloomberg, and I, I have to read this to you, here's what he said. He said, because here he is, he's an economist defending tariffs, defending tariffs on steel and aluminum, other things, with all the rest of the world's economists saying, are you crazy? And Navarro said, this is the president's vision. Um, my function really as an economist is to try to provide the underlying analytics that confirm his intuition, and his intuition is always right in these matters. Yeah, that's my facial expression too. She's got her jaw, her jaw is down like that. I mean, this is, this is the definition of sycophancy. Did I pronounce that right? Sycophant? Whew. Anyway, I love, I mean, I'm so grateful to him. This is like the best possible illustration of my, of my thesis. Anyway, <clears throat> the broader principle here is called motivated reasoning. We all do it. We all want to reach certain conclusions, and we don't say, is that conclusion justified? We say, how can I get there? We all do what Peter Navarro is doing. So I'll just show you one experiment. Um, in one study, students, they're taking Psych 101. Um, actually, how many of you have read my book? Raise your hand if you read The Righteous Mind. Okay, actually, a lot of you have. All right, I know, I'm just, just meeting with the reading group. Um, so it, in one study, students are in a psych class. They're learning uh, experimental methods. They're given a study as part of a, an outside class uh, study to evaluate how good are the methods. And the study seems to show that caffeine consumption is associated with breast cancer. And they're supposed to critique it. So who do you think finds a lot of flaws in that study? Coffee drinkers, yeah, coffee drinkers hate it, right? Yeah, all coffee drinkers? Women who drink coffee. Women who drink coffee hear that and they say, must I believe it? So this is the thing. Our mind is always asking either, must I believe it or can I believe it? If we want to believe something, we're asking, can I believe it? Can I find some scrap of justification that will permit me to believe it? And if I don't want to believe it, I'm asking, must I believe it? Am I forced to believe it? Or could I maybe discredit the, the scientists? Like maybe they were paid off, maybe, who knows? But nowadays with Google, you can discredit anything. You just look for something and then put the word fraud and you'll find some article claiming it's a fraud. Um, so, uh, and then a very brief, another one, people come into the lab and they're, they're, they sit in front of a monitor and they're paid a certain amount, let's, you know, five cents, let's say, every time they spot a letter on the screen. So a lot of stuff flashes up and if they saw that, what was that? Right, so that's, that's a B, but half the people are paid if they spot a number and for them it's a 13. So we're not crazy, we don't make stuff up. It's ambiguous. It could be a B or a 13. If you want it to be a B, it's a B. If you want it to be a 13, it's a 13. 
If you want to see support for trade tariffs in the data, somewhere you can find it. Um, so this, has, this principle, uh, remember it's intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second, has a lot of implications for our, our discussions. As passions rise on both sides of a discussion, and this is true among the Democrats and Republicans, among left and right wing Jews, among you and your spouse, as passions rise, so does motivated reasoning. And this is a big part of the reason that we have post-truth politics. Yes, social media has a lot to do with it, but if we didn't hate each other so much, we wouldn't be so gullible. Second principle is that you have to speak to the other person's emotions and intuitions. Um, in my first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, I, I use the metaphor that the mind is divided like a rider on an elephant. The rider is conscious reasoning. The elephant is very big, very smart. Um, automatic processes, including emotions. If you want, if you have an argument with someone, have you ever noticed that no matter how good your reasons are, they don't actually change their mind and admit your brilliance? Because if you're just speaking to their reason, you're not gonna do it. But if you speak to their intuitions and emotions and get them to see something different or feel something different about you, now you've taken them out of the state. Because before, they were in a must I believe it mindset. Whenever you're in an argument, the other person is thinking, must I believe it? And you cannot convince someone if they are thinking, must I believe it? But if you can get them to, can I believe it? Or there is, you know, you can be sort of in neither state maybe. If you can just sort of reduce that, then you have a chance to persuade. Okay, that's the first principle. Keep that in mind, it will make you much more effective. Uh, also read Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He really understood this. Second principle, there are six intuitive foundations of morality. Um, raise your hand if you filled out that questionnaire online about your, your moral foundations. Okay, a number of you did, good. All right, so I'll just run through it very briefly. <clears throat> um, in graduate school, I was really blown away by two, two things that seemed so powerfully true. I, I, I got my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania um, studying morality, and I first read cultural psychology and, and anthropology. And my God, is it true that morality varies around the world? And I also read evolutionary psychology. And my God, is it true that the same basic kinds of mechanisms are found everywhere? So how do you reconcile that? How is it that we are one species with, with one common evolutionary history, yet we construct these radically different moralities? And so the theory that I came up with, drawing on my postdoc supervisor, Richard Schwader, and many others, is that the moral mind is sort of like the way our tongues have five different kinds of taste bud we have almost like moral taste buds. And so the way to think about this is, because we are mammals, we have a, you know, our mammal, mammals go back 200 million years or something. Um, mammal brains, well obviously mammal bodies, fe the female body is specialized to give milk, so you have a long childhood with a lot of nurturance. And in most species, the female does all the work, the man does nothing. But some species, including ours, the, the male brain retains the nurturance instincts, and males are very good nurturers. So when we see cruelty, especially towards a helpless creature, we feel something, not just to our own kids. We don't want to see cruelty to animals. Um, so we have this taste bud about care and harm. And what I found empirically um, is that if you look at any left-wing group, and you listen to them, and you look at their signs, there's a lot of reference to care and compassion. So these are photos that I took at Occupy Wall Street. Compassion is a new currency, let's get rid of money. Free empathy, I can't hurt another without hurting myself. Okay, so these are beautiful sentiments. You would never see these at a right wing or Tea Party rally, they just don't talk that way. Now they love their children and their dogs, it's not that they're cold, but their politics, when they think, how should the nation be? They don't think, care and compassion, we have to care for people, they don't think that. People on the left think that. <clears throat> Second foundation, fairness. Every society, every person other than psychopaths cares a lot about fairness, but there's a lot of different ways to interpret fairness. So on the left, equality is very important, including a quality of outcome. So uh, the 1% own 43%. If you're on the left, that is an argument. That is an astonishing statistic saying that things are really unfair. But if you're on the right, you don't think about equality of outcome at all. You think about proportionality. And you would think, well, did the 1% generate 
43 percent, 43 times more than you know than others. I mean, maybe. I mean, I don't know. So my point is that this argument works on the left or tax the wealthy fair and square. How can they let us go hungry? So if they're hungry people, then the wealthy are not being taxed enough. On the left, that makes sense as an argument. On the right, it does not make sense as an argument because on the right, they see fairness overwhelmingly as proportionality. Um, do the crime, do the time. I think of it informally as like the law of karma. You should reap the fruits of your action. And if those actions are good, you should be rewarded. But if you do something bad, you need to be punished. And so this sign, uh, Emily Eakins took this at a Tea Party rally, stop punishing success. That's why the Republicans are always proposing these flat taxes. How about if everybody pays 9%? Why should rich people have to pay a higher percentage? That's unfair, it's disproportionate. That argument makes no sense on the left, but to some people on the right, that makes sense to them. Conversely, stop rewarding failure. Why should we bail people out if they fail due to their own laziness or if they borrow too much money to buy a house? Let them suffer, they'll learn a lesson. Those arguments seem cold and cruel on the left, but they seem intuitively obvious to many people on the right. <clears throat> Third foundation, liberty oppression. Everybody has it, left and right, but imp they implement it in different ways. Um, this is the, the seal on the flag of, of Virginia. And uh, do you ever notice that Virgi the flag of Virginia has a dead person on it? Raise your hand if you, raise your hand if this is the first time you're noticing that the flag of Virginia has a dead person on it, okay? So I don't think I noticed it until I moved to UVA uh, in 1995. <clears throat> but it makes sense once you understand the flag was made in, I think, 1778 when the English people in North America were rebelling against the English king. These were not Americans. These were English citizens, or British citizens, I should say. These were British citizens throwing off their king. And what they were doing is it, they, they were using this really powerful psychological button that we all have and that even chimpanzees have, which is when you're being bullied by an alpha, alpha male, you don't just want to fight back. That, you know, that's often suicidal. The instinct is unite with everyone else and take him down. There's an instinct to unite in the face of a bully and take him down. And if you look at the Declaration of Independence, it's almost all a list of grievances that precedes a plea for us to all join our blood and treasure, or whatever the phrase is. So it's, the Declaration of Independence is exactly this psychological taste bud um, against tyrants, six semper tyrannis. Um, uh, now on the left, this is used to, re it, it's the rich, especially back in Occupy times, it's the rich who are the bully, if the, this image says, if the 99% could get together, they could crush and kill the 1%. Um, so a violent image about killing the rich in, in this country. <clears throat> On the right, it's the same psychology, only um, it was the government that was seen to be so bad. Now this is, Trump has upended things. It, this is not, it's not the Tea Party or social conservatives in control now, it's actually the authoritarian. So things are kind of getting scrambled now. But before Trump, what I'm showing you was exactly the left-right divide. Now it's kind of mixed up. Um, <clears throat> fourth foundation, loyalty betrayal. There are many animals that can cooperate, but they're always siblings. They're always sisters and brothers. Um, there's only one species on Earth that can cooperate in large groups that are not related, and that's us. We evolved for war. We evolve for violent intergroup conflict, and we have instincts that allow us to form large groups to fight other large groups. We're very, we, this then um, causes a feeling of loyalty. We love war so much, we, our minds are evolved to think about intergroup conflict, that we invented sports, which is just ritualized war. And maybe you could understand why people like to play sports, but we love it so much that we like to watch it. And when we watch it, some people do stupid things and expose themselves not just to the elements, but to ridicule, um, because we have tribal minds. We like doing this stuff. We like becoming a larger, a larger group, a larger unit. Um, now, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't, show it, I don't show it there, but there's evidence that the right likes doing this more than the left. Now, the left can do it against the right, but in general, the right goes more, in more for you know, groupish team sports, things like that. Um, the fifth foundation is authority and subversion. As primates, we evolve to show deference and respect. We bow. Uh, a little bit differently than, than other primates, but some similarities. Um, so we show, we have evolved for authority and subversion. This is a church outside Charlottesville. Uh, God's in charge, so shut up. Now it's a joke, it was meant as a joke, but you know that it's not a Unitarian church. I mean, they would, you know, a Unitarian church would, well, I, I should, don't insult people, but um, 
if so, so they're playing with it there. But the point is that the left tends to be um, more anti-authoritarian, and the right tends to think that authority is generally a good thing. And then the last foundation, sanctity and degradation. This is the, an image of the Madonna. Uh, it's a, she's basically in a rock chastity belt with water flowing beneath her legs and lions guarding the stream of pure water. Um, here's another image of the Madonna, a very different Madonna from the 1980s. Um, the, the idea on this, uh, the cultural conservatives tend to want to hem in, especially female sexuality. Um, the left sees that as oppression. The, the social conservatives see it as guarding something that is pure and must, must um, be protected from being sullied or dirtied. Um, this is a photo in uh, a bumper sticker in Charlottesville. Your body may be a temple, but mine's an amusement park. And it's, it's Jim Webb, this uh, Democratic senator. So the left loves to laugh at the right for its, its prudery around sex, but then the right actually likes to laugh at the left for its prudery around food and all the obsessive, you know, this and that, and fair trade this and recycled that. Um, you know, it can be very hard to order. Imagine it's actually very hard to order um, breakfast here on the Upper West Side sometimes. There's just so many decisions to make about the eggs and the bread, and not the bread, but the, um, um, so I, the photo would occupy Wall Street. Nothing is sacred. I, you know, I, I don't really know what it means, but this is, you, this, you would not see this at a, at a right-wing um, rally. So to put this all together and now to bring it to that survey, um, I have a, I, my colleagues and I created a website, yourmorals.org. You can go there, register, take all kinds of surveys. Um, one that you were asked to take, that the link was sent around. Um, uh, drawing on questions from our moral foundations questionnaire, what we find overall is that when people come to the site and they register and say they're on the left, very liberal on the left side, they give the highest score, very strong endorsement to every item about care, care and compassion, very high scores. As, as we go across the spectrum on the right, you see that line for care goes down. Conservatives still value it, but not as highly as those who say they're on the left. Um, conversely, uh, in fairness, it depends on the kind, but I have proportionality graphed there. Everybody cares about proportionality. The right cares a little more about it. If I had one for equality, it would tilt the other way. But it turns out there's not an equality foundation. Equality is not a very deep moral intuition. Proportionality is much deeper. Um, whereas if you look at the bottom three lines, loyalty, authority, sanctity, the left says, no, those are not morality. Those, I, I disagree with those statements. That's like xenophobia, racism, sanctity, puritanism. No, I reject all that stuff. But the slope is fairly steep. As you become more conservative, people endorse them. And that's most of our cultural items. Most of the cultural, you point to anything, immigration, abortion, uh, anything. And it usually is going to be um, uh, a difference that we can point to easily on those, on those dimensions. So, um, so here are your scores. Here are the scores from how many of you? This is uh, 76 members of your congregation. And let me walk you through what this shows. So um, these are the original five foundations. This doesn't have, the Liberty Foundation was added later. We don't have items for that on this, on this survey. Um, what this shows is in blue, well, uh, so if you take it, you'd find your own score here in green. Uh, but I guess Shuli or somebody just gave, gave me a, did like a, just fill, pretended to fill it out, left it all blank. Um, but what this shows is, this is, uh, this is the average score on the Care or Harm Foundation from 198,000 uh, people who say that they're on the left. Um, so the average score is 3.7. Um, and this is the score for 57,000 people who say they're on the right. So as you can see, people on the left score higher on Care than, uh, than people on the right. And here's your congregation. You're higher even than, so you're, yeah. You're more liberal than the liberals. Same story on fairness, exactly the same story. 3.7 versus 3.4, and you're like 3.9 or so, okay, or four, okay? Um, now, on loyalty and authority, you're right there with the national average, okay? But interestingly, on purity or sanctity, you're actually high, uh, higher than, than liberals. Now, this is interesting to me because what you see in red and blue are the two standard patterns. The left is high on these two and low on those three. That's the standard. The right um, is, the red is, is sort of simply, you know, fairly flat. They're sort of the same on all, all of them. But what I found is that when you look at the religious left, which is mostly Christians, if you look at religious left, they're really, they're like this, they're right there with the liberals on those, but they're actually up there with the conservatives on those. So they have like all the slider switches turned up. And if 
uh, so I, I don't have a lot of data. I, well, I could look, actually. But I, don't, I haven't looked carefully at uh, different subtypes of, of Jews and Jewish congregations. But if we would look at a conservative congregation, I'm guessing that it would mostly look more like the, more like the, the red, the conservatives. But um, I think this might be the fact that in a, uh, peop people, who, people who have the idea that there is something sacred, that things are not just matter, such a person is more likely to join a congregation than someone who's low on it. That's what I make of this. Okay. Um, all right. Now, there's a really useful shorthand here, this wonderful article. Do you know this? Have you heard this, this distinction between Purim Jews and Pesach Jews? Um, it's a really useful. So Yossi Klein Halevi uh, is a, in Israel. Um, where is he? He's at some think tank. Hartman. Yeah, Hartman Institute. Um, so he wrote this wonderful essay that someone gave to me when I first came to New York and started uh, talking to, to Jewish groups. Um, and he says, um, he says, Jewish history speaks to our generation in the voice of two biblical commands to remember. The first voice commands us to remember that we were strangers in the land of Egypt, and the message of that command is, don't be brutal. That's the lesson of Passover. The second voice commands us to remember how the tribe of Amalek attacked us without provocation while we were wandering in the desert, and the message of that command is, don't be naive. That's the lesson of, of Purim. And so he continues. The first command is the voice of Passover, of liberation, of social justice, I would say. The second is the voice of Purim, commemorating our victory over the genocidal threat of Haman, a descendant of Amalek. Passover Jews are motivated by empathy with the oppressed. That's the Care Foundation and the Liberty Foundation. Purim Jews are motivated by alertness to threat. That's those military adaptations. Group loyalty, respect for authority, you know, maintain the purity of our culture, of our, of our land, the integrity of it, guard it from attack from outside, build a wall. Both are essential. One without the other creates an unbalanced Jewish personality, a distortion of Jewish history and values. So, what are you? What kind of Jew are you? I just spent, you know, 10 seconds on your website. And it's not just the social justice page. It was also, this was the real giveaway. If you can do intensive yoga with Rabbi Miriam Klotz, this is definitely a, a, a Pesach Jew kind of place. So, um, okay. So, so, so the Jewish community is split as the American, as, as the American uh, nation is, is split. Uh, the last foundation, that morality binds and blinds. Why do we have morality in the first place? It serves a lot of functions, it's complicated, but one of the functions, I believe, is that it binds groups together and then blinds them to nuance so that they can just be part of the group fighting other groups. So, uh, as I said before, cooperation is very rare on this planet. I should say large-scale cooperation is very rare. Um, you only really find examples of, in, of individual organisms coming together to build something large if they all have the same mother. So bees, ants, wasps, termites, that's a giant beehive, this is a gigantic um, termite mound in Australia. Um, they're all siblings, they all have, they're all laid by a single queen, and then they're sterile, so they're all in the same boat. It's a brilliant evolutionary strategy. These creatures are so hardy, they never go extinct. No phylum, or not phylum, there's some, at some level, none of, no ultra-social insect has ever gone extinct. They're very hardy, they're very, it's a very good strategy. The only exception to the rule I just gave you is that there are these structures that have appeared on Earth uh, in the last uh, you know, th three to 7,000 years. You get some large things being built by people who are not siblings. It always starts with a temple. Civilization always starts with a sacred building. So we humans, we have this neat trick. We're not all descended from one mother. I mean, way, way back in a sense. But what I mean is we can cooperate without being siblings if we circle around a sacred object together. So that's what we do. So that's, that's um, Babylon on the left. That's Tenochtitlan on the right. So you see it most visibly in, in Muslim worship, in the, in the Hajj, uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca. What do they do? They circle around the sacred object. And I love metaphors. Uh, I love physics metaphors for some reason. Uh, if you remember high school physics, you, if you move a wire, uh, if, you, if you move a, a wire through a magnetic field, it makes the electrons move, it generates electricity. And the sociologist Emile Durkheim 
said that religious rituals generate social electricity. If a group moves together, especially in a circle, if you, and it doesn't have to literally be a circle, if you worship together, it binds you together and now you can fight others better, you trust each other more, you're more effective. It has huge implications for your social relationships. Uh, so of course, unfortunately, we can't navigate, you know, we can't go around in a circle, but it's certainly, you know, it, this is a sacred site. Um, it doesn't have to be a religious object. Anything we do this to, if we treat it like it's sacred, and we say, no, don't let it touch the floor, um, people get that, and then they treat it as sacred, and if you're all members of the same cult treating something sacred, then you're, you're, you're a group. It binds you together. When we do that, what we do is we generate this electricity, which means that our side is perfectly good, and the other side is perfectly evil. It, we have a moral charge. Uh, and this, I, I can skip that. Well, Manichaeism is the, the ancient view of, out of a, uh, somewhere in Persia, I believe, that life is a battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. That's why I suggested to the publishers that they use angels and devils on the book. Um, and what we generally want to do with heretics, traitors, and apost uh, apostates is not reform them, not educate them. Um, it's not even enough to punish them. We want them to either burn or be exiled. Those are the two most satisfying things to do with, a, with an apostate or a, or a heretic. So this has many implications for constructive disagreement, as you might imagine. As our politics is becoming more tribal, more passionate, more like a fundamentalist religion, I said in the beginning, religion is good. At least in America, studies of congregations, religion it has all kinds of good effects. Fundamentalist religion is different. What we see in that uh, you know, Phelps church in Florida, I mean, he might be he's mentally disordered. But, as things get fundamentalist, now they become incompatible with, with religious diversity. Now you get more problems coming in. Uh, and that's what's happening in our politics. Um, and I, uh, I don't have data on whether Jews are becoming polarized, but uh, it has to be happening since it's happening everywhere else. If, if our religious community is becoming more tribal and more passionate, um, uh, uh, then it's, uh, for becoming more tribal, it's really, really bad for us. Very dangerous for Jews in America and in Israel to not be unified, to be at each other's throats. Um, but now here's where things should turn around because, you know, religious communities have certain resources, but Jews in particular have some really specific resources that should make Jews great at this. And I think Jews can be great at this and with a lot of potential. Um, uh, so let me show you. So Jews, more than any other, any other people on earth, I think, understand the necessity of disagreement and argument to find truth, maturity, and wisdom. So just a couple of quotes. This came out of working with, uh, with Rabbi Auerbach at Central. Um, so I've been a big fan of John Stuart Mill. I think he's, he's now my favorite philosopher. He's the one that we most need on campus as we are excluding non-left viewpoints, as students are saying, no, we will not allow conservative speakers on campus. Um, I've been arguing that we need, we, everybody needs to read John Stuart Mill. And so just one of my favorite quotes from On Liberty, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them. But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. And if you can imagine a college education where you don't hear both sides of many arguments, you're told, here's how it is, what's the next topic? You just report it back on the exam, that's terrible. So John Stuart Mill really understood what makes a liberal democracy tick, what makes it stable, what allows it to advance. John Stuart Mill was a true liberal in the philosophical sense and in the progressive sense. He was on the progressive side in most, uh, most issues. Um, well, Jews really, really get this point. Uh, so here's uh, from the Babylonian Talmud. Um, there's the, the, the story about uh, Rabbi uh, Yohanan and um, and Reish Lakish, um, so I'll, I'll just read this part. So they were, they were what, study partners, debating partners. Uh, Rabbi Yohanan says, you know, in my, dis uh, oh, this, I'm sorry, this, this takes place after Rabbi uh, Yohanan has what, has passed away, and, and Rabbi, uh, other way around, sorry, after, yeah. So Rabbi Yohanan is left without a partner, and he's disconsolate, and they send, the rabbis, they send him someone else to study with. And this person agrees with him on everything. Oh, yes, Rabbi, your reading is correct. 
And then uh, Rabbi Yohan says, in my discussions with Reish Lakish, when I would state a matter, he would raise 24 difficulties against me in an attempt to disprove my claim. And I would answer him with 24 answers, and the law by itself would become broadened and clarified. In the process of challenging, the law becomes broadened and clarified. And yet you say to me, there is a ruling that supports your opinion. Do I not know that what I say is good? Being rebutted by Resh Lakish served a purpose. Your bringing proof to my statements does not. And what does that make you all think of? Yes, Peter Navarro. This is not the way to get good policy. Having a bunch of lackeys firing everybody who will not be your lackey is a really, really bad way to run a country. Um, another point. Mill says, the only way in which a human being can make some approach to knowing the whole of a subject is by hearing what can be said about it by persons of every variety of opinion, studying all modes in which it can be looked at by every character of mind. No wise man ever acquired his wisdom in any mode but this, nor is it in the nature of human intellect to become wise in any other. The steady habit of correcting and completing his own opinion by collating it with those of others is the only stable foundation for a just reliance on it. We each have a piece of the truth. We need to collate what we know with what others know. And some of what we know is false, and some of what they know is false. But if we collate it, we can get the truth. Um, uh, so here's a quote that actually um, uh, Rabbi Passau sent to me uh, from uh, Rabbi Kook. Uh, there are those who erroneously believe that, the wor that world peace will come only from a common character of opinions and qualities. World peace will only come when we all think the same way, when we all agree, we find common ground, we, right? No. He says, in reality, this is not the case, because the only way true peace will come to the world is precisely through the multiplicity of peace. The multiplicity of peace comes when all possible sides and opinions and perspectives are seen, and it will become clear how each one has a place according to its value, its place, and its topic. So the Jewish tradition of engaging with so many texts which are contradictory has created a Jewish way of thinking that is perfectly suited to our present time and that should be very useful in building bridges. So Jews should be great at constructive disagreement because we can handle contradiction, paradox, and uncertainty. And here's, I think this is such a beautiful, a beautiful passage, a beautiful section. Uh, you know, the legendary battle, uh, battle between the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel. A person might think, since the house of Shammai declares something to be ritually impure, and the house of Hillel declares it to be pure, how then can I learn Torah? But all the words have been given by a single shepherd. One God creates them. The Lord of all deeds, blessed, blessed be he, has spoken them. So God said all these things. There are contradictions in what God said. And this is the beautiful line. So make yourself a heart of many chambers. I love that line. Um, bring into it the words of the house of Shammai and the words of the house of Hillel, the words of those who declare impure and the words of those who declare pure. And boy, do we need hearts of many chambers to, to live in the country that we now have. Um, and my third point, uh, Jews should be great at constructive disagreement because we understand the value of humility and generosity of spirit. Now, that may not be the stereotype of New York Jews, but at least our tradition, um, like many religious traditions, uh, talks about humility and generosity of spirit. Uh, so, Mishnah um, Avot. Ben Zoma says, who is the wise one? He who learns from all men. As it says, I have acquired understanding from all my teachers. Who is the mighty one? He who conquers his impulse. Slowness to anger is better than a mighty person, and the ruler of his spirit is better than the conqueror of a city. So again, there's resources that should make us good at this kind of, of, uh, of, of, of discussion. Um, let's see. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this. I'm going to skip this. Just in the interest of time, this was already in your, uh, in your reading. So uh, let me see where we are on time. Actually, we're doing okay. Okay, so what can you do as a community? So if you have a community here, uh, which is largely uh, Pesach Jews, that's at least the dominant way of being, the dominant morality here, um, what can you do? Um, and so I'd like to, to end with this beautiful story that, that Shuli sent around. I guess I don't know how many of you read it. It was sent out as an email to the whole congregation, so you've, you've seen it. Um, but she was listening to the Brian Lehrer show. And she liked the guest, uh, thought he made some sense, and then she learned that it's Arthur Brooks, um, who is the president of AEI, which is kind of a libertarian, pro-free market think tank in Washington. 
And then Shuli writes, I, a rabbinical student committed to the values of justice and peace, who had not long before led an Occupy Rosh Hadesh service in Zuccotti Park, was nodding along with something that Arthur, Arthur Brooks um, had to say. Um, and that's where the moment of personal growth happened. She says, it occurred to me that all I really knew about the American Enterprise Institute was what I had told myself it was about based on pretty much nothing. The only reason I thought he was opposed to everything I care about was that I had convinced myself that he was opposed to it based on the labels by which he defines himself. I'd never really read any of AEI policy papers, never heard him speak before. It then occurred to me that had I known from the outset that I was listening to Arthur Brooks that morning, my progressive biases would have prevented me from being open to his ideas. Remember, intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. Had she known he was a conservative, she would have been thinking, must I believe it? And the answer to that question is always no. But because she didn't know, she was open. And she thought, oh, this makes some sense. And, it was, and that, I assume, was the learning experience, was realizing how much you have missed because of these labels that we all apply. And I hope you'll speak about this in, the, in a moment we, when we go to the discussion section. Um, so I began learning more about AEI after that, listening to Brooks speak. It turns out he cares an awful lot about poor people, income inequality, and the dangers of unbridled individualism. We have some different perspectives about the best way to achieve certain goals, and we use different language, uh, but there's a lot of common ground between him and me. This is the kind of attitude that, that we need. This is what moral leadership, I think, is going to look like in the coming decades. Um, so I'm gonna end with three suggestions for, for your community. <clears throat> Um, one is try out this wonderful new app, this new program we've developed at Heterodox Academy called the Open Mind app. Try it out within your congregation and see if it makes it easier for you to talk about difficult or divisive topics. Here's how it works. If you go to heterodox, heterodoxacademy.org, that's the opposite of orthodoxacademy.org, which doesn't exist except at many universities. Um, um, so we, we've created a whole bunch of things that we think are useful. One of them is called the Open Mind app. Um, uh, and if you, what, what it, it, it takes you on a walk through moral psychology, you learn about motivated reasoning, you learn why we have trouble agreeing, and then you learn skills for talking across divides. So it's five steps. You, we first make the pitch for why you'll benefit from un understanding viewpoint diversity. We then have some steps to cultivate intellectual humility, learn some psychology, break free from your moral matrix, and finally, skills to prepare for productive disagreement. Um, so if you, uh, well, you can find it from heterodoxacademy.org or you can go directly to openmindplatform.org. Um, two, another suggestion for you. Um, my reading of Talmud is basically only the quotes that I showed you there. I've never read the Talmud otherwise. Um, I'm, I, I love chapter two of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. And at Heterodox Academy, next week we're gonna publish a version of just chapter two, edited to be really readable with beautiful illustrations. Um, so I would suggest if you have uh, any sort of Torah study groups or any sort of reading groups, get, look at Mill, look at the Torah, just look at, you know, there must be differences and similarities, and then maybe bring in, uh, there's also several Buddhist traditions, like the Dalai Lama is from a tradition that really does a lot of debate and argument. So I think religious traditions, uh, uh, BJ would be a perfect place to do a project on how, how various religious traditions have come to the same conclusions about the value of debate and disagreement. Um, and so there's just we, we, this uh, illustrated edition, uh, which you can find at Heterodox Academy. That's fine. No, I think the battery might have just died. Oh, no. I got it. I'm so close to the end of the show. Okay. Um, and, and then uh, the last, the advanced credit assignment. This one is, I think, more difficult. Um, but think, what would it, do you actually have you reached out? Have you done things with really conservative congregations? So that would be, that's the advanced credit part. If you can do the first two, then consider, you know, I don't know how this would work. I, don't, I, I assume there would be benefits, but consider what you might do. Now, they would probably be a lot less open to it than you. The left is more open to novelty, to connections. So in general, I do a lot of things with bipartisan groups. You get a lot of people on the left, you get one or two people who are sort of just barely center right, and then it's bipartisan. It's harder to find conservatives to engage in than it is progressives. But try it, try, try, conversing about, about Jewish topics in America, about Israel, um, uh, see what happens. Okay, 
so I'll just end, oh, um, I'll end with a, no, you know what, I won't, I won't show the video. I have a th three minute video. I, you know, wait, should I? Actually, people like video, I'll show it, I'll show it. Okay, so we, at Heterodox Academy, we created this three minute video to illustrate graphically why viewpoint diversity is so essential for finding truth. So let's see if this, let's see if this plays. What is reason? Philosophers have long told us it is humanity's highest and noblest attribute. It's what separates us from other animals. It's what allows us to separate truth from falsehood. There's just one problem. When psychologists study real people trying to reason, what they find is that reason has a gigantic, crippling flaw. It's called the confirmation bias. People don't use their reasoning abilities to find the truth. They use reason to confirm the views that they already hold. Now put people into teams where everyone holds the same beliefs and the confirmation bias grows into a collective mania. Everyone helps everyone else find reasons why their side is right, further deepening shared bonds. Heaven help any individual who thinks for herself or who looks for evidence on the other side. Such people are called traitors and groups have many ways of shutting them up. When everyone's beliefs line up and when dissenters are punished, that's the definition of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy can be great if you're heading into battle and you want everyone marching in lockstep, but what if your goal is truth rather than victory? What if you actually wanted to help students overcome their confirmation bias and learn about the perspectives of others? What if you wanted to create a community of researchers who could actually study and solve social problems? In other words, what if you wanted to create a university? Would you want orthodoxy? Or would you want its opposite, heterodoxy? where multiple views are not just permitted, but encouraged. In a heterodox university, each person can still use their reasoning powers to find reasons why they are right and others are wrong. But here's the brilliant thing. Each person becomes the solution to someone else's confirmation bias. This is why universities must have viewpoint diversity. Viewpoint diversity is the only reliable way to get around confirmation bias. Viewpoint diversity is the secret to a great education. It may not always be comfortable, but when ideas collide, we learn, we grow together. Everyone gets smarter. The alternative? Campuses that try to protect students from unapproved ideas, books, and speakers. A politically orthodox university discourages dissent, creativity, empathy, and truthfulness. That's why more than a thousand academics from across the political spectrum have joined Heterodox Academy. Working with students, professors, and administrators, Heterodox Academy is rebuilding the culture of free inquiry and open civil debate that turns universities into engines of discovery, growth, and progress. Support free inquiry. Share your voice. Stand up for viewpoint diversity. Visit heterodoxacademy.org. Let's talk. Thank you so much. I have to say, I'm, I'm a little bit speechless because um, not only did you answer all the questions that I was going to ask, uh, I did not know that I was going to make an appearance in your presentation. Perfect. And you have also laid out all of the work that I need to do over the next five years. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a little bit at a loss for words. Um, and uh, we'll open it up in just a moment to, uh, to Q&A from, from uh, the audience here. I want to do two things. First, um, first to introduce uh, Simon Greer, who will also be coming around uh, with me with a handheld mic to, to help folks um, ask, and ask questions um, and engage in discussion. Simon has been con doing some consulting to BJ on the Faith and Public Life Project. He's also worked uh, with Dr. Height in previously, uh, John, on previous projects um, around this, this type of uh, issue, how do we dialogue across difference. Um, I, I do want to ask you one question, kind of touching on the last 
uh, the last few points that you made about next steps for a congregation like this. So um, it seems to me that the three things that you noted have largely are related to discussion. How can we have discussions within our congregation or reach out to, uh, to Purim Jews, to other types of Jewish congregations or perhaps other types of faith congregations? This is also a community that's very big on action. Um, we have a history of being involved in all kinds of campaigns and political work and direct service. Do you have thoughts on how, how some of the ideas and the lessons that you are bringing to us through your presentation could inf influence or impact some of the action that we take? Uh, the, that's a great question. The, so uh, to the extent that you're, to the extent that it, as a community you're undertaking actions that are helping the poor, you're, you're, you're helping people, There's, you don't need to discuss, you don't need to learn anything to know whether that's the right thing to do. <clears throat> but I'm thinking a lot about campus activism these days, that there's a lot of, of activism among young people, and normally we think that's a good thing, and we're all supposed to say what a good thing it is. But I've been thinking recently that if you get a group of experts together to, uh, to, to address a problem, and they come up with a fix, for some sort of social policy solution, um, and then it's implemented, there's a very good chance it's gonna make things worse. It's really, really hard to, to fix social problems. And if people are really thinking their best and they've got a lot of experience, it's better than 50% chance that they'll make progress, but they really might not. And so now if you think about a group of young people who are very passionate, who are pushing for some solution, some change of policy on campus, some change of the laws, and these are young people who are very passionate and who generally will not allow much dissent, so they know what they, they need to do, there's no argument about it, um, and then they're gonna press people to do it, there's a good chance they're gonna make things worse. And I think that's a lot of what happens on campus, is that we, we then implement these policies that I think often make the climate, uh, uh, they, they make trust worse. So I'm actually, I actually think that the very idea of activism needs to be rethought. Because activism generally presupposes we know what's right, um, we know that we're right and you're wrong. Now sometimes that will be correct, but sometimes it's exactly backwards. And so I'm no longer much of a fan of activism unless it is tied to some sort of a community that is at least open to critique, that can show that it evolves over time, that is responsive to evidence. So if you are such a community and then you choose to act, then that's great. You actually have a, a real basis for your action. So that's all I would say is discussion and openness to outside critique should be, a, should be um, a necessary stage before you actually try to act on the world, other than helping the poor and the hungry. That doesn't need much discussion. Okay, I'll, I'll let you call on people. I, I was going to ask one thing, but actually you just sort of touched on it, and so I'll make it a little bit broader. Um, I find that I, I can have constructive uh, disagreement or dialogue with people who are willing to enter into a dialogue or, or a conversation or a debate. Um, but there are people who, for example, say there's no such thing as evolution or Jews are devils or women should never be allowed to run a country or a corporation or any of these other things, in which case I honestly don't know what the way in is. Um, and the last thing that you just said, as long as people are open to dialogue based on evidence, sounds to me like people who are therefore committed to some degree of reason. So evidence is a part of a reasoned dialogue, right. not necessarily an intuitive dialogue. Okay, um, so tell me exactly when or what year it was when you last tried to have a conversation with a person who thought that Jews are devils. What year was that? Two years ago. Where was it? Tell me, a person who thought you were a devil? The Jews are devils? Not, uh, not me personally. They said, it, they said that they thought Jews were devils. Okay. And when did you meet a person who thought that a woman shouldn't be allowed to run a country? Oh, I hear it on TV. Really? Sure. I didn't hear that at any point in the last election. But, but the point is there are such people, so... Okay, but wait. Yeah. I don't doubt that there are such people in the world but you presented this as though you're open to debate and you draw on evidence, but those people on the other side, a lot of them have views that are so reprehensible that I can't possibly talk with them. And what I'm trying to establish is whether you think that's 1% of those people or 50%. What do you think? 
I have no idea. Okay, probably closer to 1%, maybe 2%. Um, what we do is we construct the worst possible version of the other side, and they're doing exactly the same thing to us. And they're having the same, well, yeah, they're also saying, you know, I could talk with a reasonable liberal, but there aren't any reasonable liberals left. So I'm sorry to, I, I, I just want to push back because in how we frame, in how we frame the situation, that's where you see our biases. And so you're not alone here. A lot of people probably think that way, that you're open, but the other side is just such, such close-minded troglodytes that I can't talk with them. And what I would say is, even if, even if you meet someone who has the most reprehensible views you can imagine, you can still have a great conversation with them. And I would commend you, I would point you to, Jeremy, what was the, uh, the black musician who befriended the Klan members? What's his name? Anyone know? Daryl Davis, thank you. Amazing guy. He decided that he was going to try to actually persuade Klan members to give up their robes. And he'd go up to them, or he'd meet them in, you know, I can't remember how he found them, but he would talk to them about music, and it turns out they'd never really had a black friend, or whatever it is, he was able to have great conversations with them. And many of them gave up their robes. So I would say that even if someone has reprehensible views, if you start off on the wrong foot, it's going to go badly. But if you start off on the right foot, it, you actually can have a conversation with anyone. The right foot is, I think, is usually acknowledging something that they're right about, which it might be hard in these cases. But even still, you can do it if, if you think hard. So, okay, you think a woman shouldn't be able to, okay, if you're somebody who's anti-Hillary, you might say, um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing that you, know, you think it's very important to have a really steady, stable hand, uh, you know, at, at the helm. Right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, if you just start, even that, it's just acknowledging, it's not just that you hate women, it's that you think that there's something that we need. I'm just saying there's always a way when you can start off positively or praising or criticizing your side. So there are ways to do it. And again, Dale Carnegie is the best guide for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Sheila, I'm going to... Or should I call yeah. you? Okay. Right. Yes. No. So privilege is is become is all the rage in the academy, and while there is some truth to it, or there is there is a, there is a, there is a valid idea there which is that certain people will carry themselves with certain expectations and other people can't make those expectations. So it's not a terrible notion, it, it, is, it is rooted in some truth. Um, but I think it has some very pernicious effects. So <clears throat> um, one thing that it does, because young people in many colleges now are educated from orientation, and even now it's, really, it's all over high school. A lot of you probably send your kids to private schools, fancy left-leaning private schools. Raise your hand if you have, raise your hand if you have kids in high school. Raise your hand. Okay. For those of you, have, have your kids come back talking about privilege? Is that something they talk about? Yeah. Um, when you, we are a tribal species, really, really good at dividing things into good and evil. And we made a lot of progress in this country. It used to be that if someone looked at you and they saw your race or they saw your religion or they saw your last name, they'd make a judgment about you. And that's the world my parents were raised in in New York in the 1930s and so. Uh, and boy, have we made progress um, on that. Unfortunately, in the last two or three years, I think we're reversing progress because young people are learning. Just look at someone. I can see you're a white man. That means, and somebody else, if somebody's a black woman, they are marginalized on two counts and you're a marginalizer. I don't know what we can, the phrase marginalized people, marginalized communities. It locks in the idea that America is a matrix of oppression in which some people, based on their race, gender, and a few other traits, are the marginalized and the oppressors, and the others are the victims. Now imagine having a multi-ethnic, multi-racial democracy in which we teach people. Some people are good, some people are evil. You can tell by their skin color. This is a terrible, terrible thing to do. This is one of the reasons I think there is so much anger and activism on campus. Because even though America is getting better and safer and juster over many decades now, young people see it as being so irretrievably racist, sexist, homophobic. Universities homophobic? Have you been to a university in the last 10 or 20 years? I mean, it, so it's kind of losing touch with reality. I think it's having a lot of pernicious effects. Um, I'm 
going to ask this one too. Okay. Um, your theory, the way you stated it, makes a lot of sense. I, I work at a university. And okay. Oh, into the mic. Mm -hmm. and, and what university? <coughs> um, Columbia. Okay. Um, what I'm curious about, though, is your theory is stated as a truth. The only way to achieve these things is. And what you are recommending to us, thank you, what you're recommending to us is that we try out our truths by presenting them to people who will disagree with them mm -hmm. so that our truths can get um, clarified, extended. I'd like to hear a bit about your engagement with the Heterodox um, Academy. Center Academy you set up and folks on campuses who really disagree, and has that been constructive engagement? Have you tried to initiate that? Mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful to hear about the walk you've walked mm -hmm. with your, right. you know, what you're talking to us sure, about. Sure, sure. Okay, so first, um, did I say that something was the only way? If I did, I probably misspoke. What did I say was the only way? It might have been Mills whose quote said uh, the only way, and I took You know, that's a very good question. Yours. When I, you're right. When I was reading that, I noticed that too. You're right. He should not have said the only way. He should have said the best way. He could have, he could have said the best way, which would be his assertion. <laughs> so no, you're right. Um, and I try to avoid that, but I don't always succeed. Right. So. Got it. Okay. On the larger question about engagement, so uh, this all started when I gave a talk in 2011 to my community of social psychologists about this problem. And there was a debate, and I refined my views, and they refined their views. So that was all very productive within the community of social psychologists. Um, we then formed, ultimately, we formed Heterodox Academy in 2015, and that was uh, September of 2015, just before everything blew up right. with the Yale Halloween protests and all of that. Right. Since then, things have been very, very tense on campus um, yes. and in this whole space. Yeah. And there's been, um, surprisingly, no argument against us. Um, there was one station, one, no, nobody has like debated us, nobody has really challenged us. Um, there have been certain slurs directed at us. There was a, a, a philosopher at Yale who wrote something bad about us, but it wasn't at all disagreeing with what we're saying. It's just, you know, accusing us of punching down, that sort of thing. So there are arguments about, there are arguments made about my race and my sex, um, but nobody has, in the academy has really argued with me that I know of. Now we're, gonna, we're trying to push that. We're hoping that we'll get pushed back. So in other words, can you, can you think of an argument against viewpoint diversity that we should all think the same? Um, I think if you came to Columbia and talked to activist student groups on campus, they would make arguments against what you're saying. Uh, no, I would love that. I, again, my prediction is that they would not. My prediction is that they, because what's happening to young people in activist circles is they learn a style of rhetoric, right. which is all about placement. It's not about the arguments, it's about placement. So yes, they would talk about my privilege. Yes, they would talk about the experiences of various people in marginalized communities. But if I'm making a set of arguments about identity politics, that there's a good kind and a bad kind, and I make psychological arguments about the importance of having an overarching, encompassing identity, I'm making a psychological argument about how to achieve the goals that they want. And I don't think, my prediction is that they would rarely argue back. They would just, so it happened, look what happened to Mark Lilla. So Mark Lilla makes an argument, he's a professor at Columbia, makes an argument about how identity politics is destroying the left. He is on the left, wants the left to win. He writes this that the left will do better identity politics. And what happens? One of his colleagues at Columbia doesn't argue back. She says something like, take what he's wearing, he's got a white mask on or something. Like that's not an argument, that's a slur. But please, please push back. What, have, I, have I addressed your concern or do you think Sure. Uh, you know, it's an empirical question how it would work if you took this out to activist groups. Um, they might not be approaching you, but I think it would be really interesting for you as well as for them to have the dialogue yeah. about this approach. Yeah, That's that will happen because my book comes out on July 17th and I'll be speaking at many college campuses and I'm hoping that I get protested and boycotted. That'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> Who has the microphone? Okay, back here. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. I want to take this in a little bit different direction. You were talking a lot about religion, 
And you started out with a quote saying how religious people in some ways are better citizens and they show more compassion. You also showed a set of graphs which show at least amongst liberal congregations that they sort of track with liberal values, but they also track with the sacred. So there's this idea that amongst religious peoples that you might, um, you might get some advantage as far as the types of progress that you're trying to make, the kind of progress you're trying to make. On the other hand, you talked about this kind of circling, this electrical circling that happens, and you gave the example of Mecca, which is obviously the apiotis of religion. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the tensions between this idea that religion is going to help you or religion is going to divide you, and also keeping in mind that in that earlier, in the very first graph you gave, you talked about how differences changed with religion, but that left out that in this country, I think that 8 to 10%, actually there is a drop of participation in religion in the country overall. So it kind of works against that. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I would have been oversimplifying if I said religion is good, period. Let, so let me clarify. Um, as these sociologists studied religious congregations in the United States, they found that the effects of religion were positive on many, many metrics. But as you, I think what's behind your question is that we look around the world and we see all kinds of atrocities committed in the name of religion. Um, in America, we have a free market in religions. People, Christians in particular, switch, con switch uh, denominations all the time. So denominations have to be really, really appealing. One reason it's thought that Americans are more religious than Europeans is that our religions are much, much better. In Europe, they had state religions. What happens when you have a state supermarket? It has terrible stuff to offer. But if you have a free market in religions where every congregation is competing to lure people in. So when I taught at UVA, I would assign my students to go visit a moral community that they reject, that's very different from them. And I did it myself a couple. I went to like an Assemblies of God church. You go to these fundamentalist churches and you are just love bombed. I mean, they are so pleased to meet you. They welcome you. Like American religions are really, really positive. Not, not every single one necessarily. Um, so that's, so I'm talking about Ameri yeah. in America it's evolved. And that's one of, one of the great, so America has a long history with freedom of religion, tolerance of religion. Other countries don't. Please do it. Yeah, rejoinder is good. Okay, so that that's a great first start um, to the answer. But there's also a kind of when you were asking about, for instance, does this congregation engage with conservative congregations? And there's a kind of split of authoritarianism or respect for for authority. I shouldn't say authoritarianism, but respect for authority and morality in certain types of congregations and a different type of respect for other things. And you end up having a reenactment of that liberal conservative split in the general culture within these congregations. You see the same thing in, in Catholicism with, uh, you know, with, the, with conservative cardinals versus the current papacy. And so you end up with, with the same kinds of tensions. And I was just wondering if you could address sure. that. Sure. Well, you. why are you sending people to Michigan to talk with correction officers when you could be sending them to Brooklyn to talk with Jews? Seriously, why? Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe Simon can speak to that since he's the one who came up with the idea of going to Michigan. <laughs> um, we're going, you know, for I think m many folks here know that there's a small group of us who are going to be going to Michigan and then folks from Michigan who are coming here to visit BJ at the end of June uh, from the Michigan Corrections Officers, uh, co Corrections Organization, which is a union of corrections officers uh, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, and we're going there for two reasons. One, because Simon has done a lot of work with that group and there's a relationship there and they have a whole program around conservative member engagement and there's a group of people who we know are really interested and open to having a dialogue and some kind of an exchange with people from our type of community, a largely liberal community, um, in, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I would say there's value in um, the project of travel, of going really outside of our environs, what we're familiar with, and going to a totally new place. And you could think about this any time that you've been to a new country or you've been to some place that's been completely foreign. It, it shakes off some of your blinders and some of your um, perhaps preconceived notions and, and just puts you in a new environment and a new mental space to be able to encounter new ideas. So I think there's value okay. in that no, as well. I wasn't questioning that there's value. I do agree there's value, especially from the American project of reaching across the American political divide. Absolutely. There's, um, what I was trying to suggest is that, is that 
any sort of encounter like this is going to go better to the extent that you can draw a circle around it and say we are all X, we are all Jews, we are all Americans, we are all something. And so, I, again, as I said, I don't know how this would go. It might be very awkward. But, but to the extent that you, you might say, you know, look, I mean, anti-Semitism is on the rise, hate crimes are on the rise, what's happening with this country that, you know, we, you know, we Jews have to at least be talking to each other. And, and I, I, again, I don't know how it would go. I'm just saying that um, to the extent that you can point to a common, um, a common identity, that is an advantage in these talks. And what I see happening, a lot of diversity policies on campus, is they're getting rid of any common identity. They're focusing on, on differences. That, I think, from a social psychological perspective, I, I think is, uh, is, is not the wisest way to do, do these conversations. So I think we're going to take one last question. Someone in the front has yeah. the microphone. Where's the other microphone? Okay. Oh, no, thank, got it. Okay. thank you. Um, just two points that, that have come to my attention. One, um, the initial conversation uh, about engaging with someone who says all Jews are devils. I mean, from my experience and as a psychotherapist also, um, yes, you can engage that person, but uh, like uh, I'm remembering years and years ago, I, I dated a, a Frenchman who had grown up very anti-Semitic and he said to me, um, oh, you're really not like other Jews, you're fine. Mm -hmm. But that person can bounce back into their default just because they meet someone who breaks what their prejudices are doesn't mean you're going to totally change their opinion, uh, like the Ku Klux Klan of all black individuals. Um, you know, I, I've had friends who are Catholic, and I agree with you about the Jewish expansion of, of being able to see many sides. I mean, many people who grow up as fundamentalist grow up and were punished for asking questions mm -hmm. and for wanting to have many different uh, gradations rather than black and white. Mm -hmm. So those people are growing up into fundamentalism and it's very hard to alter their position. Right. Um, you can try, certainly, and I admire your trying, but it's, it's really sometimes like hitting a brick wall. Mm -hmm. And um, okay. I guess as a woman, I also <clears throat> resent um, in some ways, you know, I've been, worked with many victims of sexual abuse where they've been told to think about their abusers, to see the other side, to forgive. And as women, we often are told to be the mediators, to forgive, to be compassionate. But what is happening from that other side? Where are those people doing the work? We are being asked to do a lot of the work, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just okay. wanting that. Okay, sure. So it, when there's the case of an abusive relationship, and especially if there's physical violence, and especially if research shows there are recurring patterns in which the woman tries to accommodate or apologize, um, then no, I'm not saying that, that the woman should just try to make peace. There are often traps, there are patterns that are abusive, and the only thing to do is get away and get a restraining order. So this is not a claim that everyone should always uh, capitulate or, or anything like that. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, an argument focused on political disagreements, which is what's tearing our country apart. Um, um, the difference between left, right, Republican, Democrat has gotten larger and larger in the recent decades. We have a few fissures in this country, race, gender, class, and politics. Of those four, Two are, have gotten a lot better. Race and gender have gotten a lot better. Class is getting worse. And politics is getting worse. Those are the two I think we should be focusing on, class and politics. But what we focus on on campus, at least, is the first two. So it's not that they're not important, but I'm saying decade by decade, we should be reevaluating what are the real problems in this country. And I think the left-right problem is the one that might do us in. Um, if America ends, and it could end, um, there might not, 50 years from now, there might not be a single country called America anymore with the same 50 states. I'm not betting on that, I'm just saying it's now possible. Five years ago, I would not have thought that was possible. Um, if it ends, it's because we allowed the, a couple of divisions, probably the political division, to fester. So uh, I'm not saying that, there are, there are true victims, um, but just because someone holds a stereotyped view of you does not mean they're a bad person or that you're a victim. 
we all have stereotypes. People on the left tend to focus on stereotypes as one of the worst things a person could have. But we all have stereotypes. Your brain will make stereotypes no matter what you do. You cannot stop your brain from having stereotypes. And you have stereotypes about all kinds of people, including various kinds of conservatives. So um, I take your points. And I don't want to be saying, you know, oh, never judge. Although, of course, a lot of ancient wisdom, Buddha, not, not Jesus so much, but a lot of ancient wisdom is never judge. I'm not saying that. But in general, if you had a switch on your kid's head that said, wherever they're set, I'm going to turn it up so that they're more responsive, more angry, they react to more stuff, they don't let anything get by. I'm going to turn it down. Because sometimes it's going to happen that someone insults them, and they're not even going to notice, or they're not going to respond. Raise your hand if you would turn the switch up so that no one ever gets anything over on your kid, but there'd be false positives. Raise your hand if you would turn it up to make them more angry, more out outraged. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you turn it down if you could. Okay. That's where we are as a species and as a country. We need to turn it down. There are exceptions, and so I take your point that there are exceptions. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. I just want to very briefly, in closing, I want to ask you to raise your hands again. Raise your hands if you heard something tonight that resonated with you, that you were nodding along with at some point. Great. And raise your hand tonight if you heard something uh, that, that didn't resonate, that challenged or agitated you, that you thought, must I believe that? OK, a lot of people. So I think this evening would be a success. Uh, <laughs> so uh, John, I want to thank you again for being here. Uh, there are some upcoming Faith in Public Life events that are on the handout on your sheet. And also, there's a table on the side for some of our activism. Uh, and uh, invite you to go take a look at that. Thanks for being here tonight, everybody. <laughs>